Welcome to another episode of Out of the Blank Podcast. Ken, it is a pleasure to have you on the show. Can you please introduce yourself to everyone out there listening? Well, thanks for having me on. I'm Dr. Ken Bridges. I'm a professor of history, political science, and geography at South Arkansas College. Also write uh, the History Minute column, which is a syndicated column in 91 uh, newspapers. Um, and sometimes the wire service will pick it up and it goes beyond there. Um, I've written seven books, got six kids and two cats. <laughs> Uh, you live a busy life. I gotta, I gotta ask, why do you find history so fascinating? I mean, I'm only finding out probably the past couple of years that's got a little bit of those golden nuggets, I'd say, in it. At least that one that sparks your interest. Uh, it's just such interesting. You know, all these little stories about uh, about people, the things they did. With history, there's always something for everybody. Um, you name the field, uh, history touches on it in some way. It's the real crossroads of all the different academic disciplines. Um, you can you know, science, engineering, um, celebrity, uh, names and dates, facts, statistics. You can find it all. It's, it's it's about humanity. It's about human nature, who we are, what we want to be, and uh, what we ultimately become. How'd you, how'd you come across a name like Howard Hughes? I, I found out later in life, I've never seen Aviator. I know every time I mention Howard Hughes, someone always goes, oh, yeah, it's the Aviator. And I'm like, no, no, no. I haven't seen that movie yet, but I can tell you that I don't think Martin Scorsese can do an accurate, I don't think anybody can do an accurate depiction of what Howard Hughes was really like. Yeah, because so much of it's kind of surrounded in mystery. Uh, he was this larger-than-life figure. Um, uh, actually, and, you know, the real problem you have with uh, any kind of biopic, it's like, uh, you ever see the movie Mank uh, on Netflix uh, about the famous uh, Hollywood writer Herman Mankiewicz? wrote uh, to everything from Wizard of Oz to uh, Citizen Kane. He, uh, the, uh, the character playing him, Gary Oldman, delivers this great line, said, in two hours, you can't tell everything about a man's life, but you can give the impression of it. And with movies like The Aviator, yeah, we get an impression of who uh, uh, Howard Hughes was. Uh, just this titanic, larger-than-life figure, but problem of trying to take a 70 year life and compress it into two hours it's hard you have to leave out a bunch of things you have to time compress a lot of it try to um sometimes you have to invent characters to try to uh try to explain uh, the story or combine different people what somebody may have someone else may have said something but they're treating to this one character it's trying to get the impression of what this uh, life was like and a lot about the movie The Aviator, it, it is ac a lot of it is accurate, but there's a lot of it that's kind of exaggerated, um, kind of distorted uh, from one time period to another. But Howard Hughes, uh, he uh, amazed um, the country and the entire world. Uh, he uh, was born in Houston, Texas. His father was an inventor, made invented this new uh, drill bit for oil drilling the guy made a fortune uh, started this huge million dollar company called the Hughes Tool Company pieces of it still exist today so Howard Hughes grew up he had a ton of money multi-millionaire uh, pretty much from birth well um, family uh, ran, um, ran in tragedy his uh, mother died when he was 17 he's very close to her uh, Ectopic, ectopic pregnancy and um, his father died when he was 19 um, so he's 19 years old it's all alone in the world and he's got millions and millions of dollars at his disposal and he uses Hughes Tool Company to basically build this huge empire he doesn't just live the high life he wants to build off this. and like his father Hughes has always had this great imagination, even from youth. Um, he was 11. It's 19, uh, 16. He builds one of the first wireless radio transmitters in Houston. He was a ham radio operator, um, the first one in Houston. Like I said, this is still years for the broadcast radio, and he had already figured it out. Um, he built a... Uh, motorcycle for himself when he was 13 using parts from his dad's shop 
Uh, brilliant Damn, man. I just done. figured out how to do taxes too. God. It just one of those people is just his mind is like a steel trap. Just brilliant man by any definition. And he loved figuring things out. He loved putting things together. And that passion followed him into adulthood. He wanted didn't just want to sit back. He wanted to build. He wanted to explore. He wanted to create. He wanted to do it all. And he did it all. Yeah, he took his first flight lessons when he was 14. Um, this is like 1919, just right after the uh, World War I. Very, very few licensed pilots anywhere in the country. And he's a kid. He's already learning how to fly. And uh, he's fascinated by it. I want to see how do planes work and how to make a bigger and better, faster airplane. He was really was one of the best pilots in the country in the 1930s. Um, he was one of the top movie makers in the world uh, in the 1930s, 1940s. He was one of the richest and most powerful men in the country. Um, but uh, he was kind of eccentric. He had obsessive compulsive disorder. And uh, as time went on, it just got worse and worse for a variety of reasons. Um, you know, that obsessive attention to detail is that that helped him when he's building all these new and state-of-the-art aircraft. He's making these new state-of-the-art movies. But it made his personal life a mess. Yeah, he dated a lot of starlets, but his relationships were uh, um, kind of unstable. Uh, like I said, he's married twice, but uh, like I said, divorced twice, uh, never had any kids. Um, had a bunch of uh, 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 mistresses he's seeing on the side. All right, before we get into all that, I have to ask, his plane crashes, do you think that led to some of his pain? Or is, it's, I, I know that one of his crashes was really bad. He almost died. Um, I don't know if you can maybe explain that crash if you know it. I don't know what your areas of Howard Hughes are. I'm only really, I guess, knowledgeable in, I guess, his later life portion. Not just like the interesting, really eccentric stuff, but I know a bit about his flight career and things of that sort. But um, it's mostly the stuff that usually pops up when you Google his name is kind of like how he bought the Desert Inn and kind of rebuilt Vegas. And we'll get to that, I'm sure. But I just wanted to know more about like his plane crash. I would have to think that, I mean, you're 19 years old. Both your parents are gone. You're basically kind of not stunted growth, but you have all this money. You don't know anybody to tell you, hey, you might want to save some of that. You might want to do this. You're kind of just spending. And his uh, aviation career is usually what stands out. I mean, I think he flew around the world in 91 hours or 92 hours or something like that. Uh, except one of the best pilots in the world at the time, he's building his own airplanes. Um, in fact, he used a lot of the airplanes he built for his uh, own airline, TWA. But Hughes, um, actually, one of the fastest pilots in the world. He built, he uh, established a couple, several uh, flight records. Uh, his first speed record was like, uh, like 392 miles an hour, slow by today's standards. That was lightning fast at the time, fastest man in the world. Uh, he flew, uh, First transcontinental airline, fastest transcontinental airline uh, trip, uh, seven hours from Los Angeles to Newark, New Jersey. That was a speed record time. Uh, his round the world flight, of course, he'd land and refuel, but uh, 91 hours. That was just incredibly fast time period. And that got the world's imagination. You know, you got these all these great other uh, pies, the Wiley Post, uh, Wright brothers still around, so many others, all the World War I flying aces. But Hughes was, his name was up at the top of all those. Built plane, built fast planes, he knew how to fly them. And uh, he, yeah, fortunately, though, he was in several crashes. Um, when he's filming Hell's Angels, a real kind of passion project is, um, he produced, directed the movie. I had a lot to say in the writing of it. But uh, that 19, uh, it was 1930 movie, that was state-of-the-art at the time. It was like the 1930 versions of Top Gun. And there were a couple of scenes that had took a lot of uh, these dogfights that took some very dangerous kind of flying. And some of his pilots on it, and his uh, 
other producers saying, no, don't do this flight, change it up somehow. But he was insisting, no, it's got to be done this way. So he flew this one dangerous stunt himself on film, but at, but he crashed on it. Serious head injury from it. He survived. And uh, there's that one famous incident from uh, 1943. Um, Hughes Aviation had this uh, huge contract from the uh, uh, from the U.S. Uh, Army Air Force to build this new super fast uh, reconnaissance aircraft. Hughes took it on the test flight himself. Why not? He owns the company, loves to fly. Don't dare to tell him no. People saying maybe you should give it over to someone else, but he said no. This is the XF-11. And he's flying it along, and suddenly um, there's a sudden loss of oil pressure. He loses control of the airplane, uh, but he's over Los Angeles. He's trying to gain, regain control of the aircraft. He's uh, uh, tr and the situation gets worse. He's trying to make sure he doesn't crash into anybody. So he tries to actually try to land it at a nearby golf course. Um, but along the way, though, the plane's descending too fast. He crashes into three houses, bounces down, um, causes a bunch of fires. His plane explodes. He's pulled out, barely alive, severely burned, head injuries, uh, bone breaks. And uh, lucky to have been alive. But afterward, Hughes is critically injured. Got all these burns, horribly painful. Um, but uh, he's got all these breaks in his body, you know, uh, that just never quite heal right, always hurting him a little bit. And so he's taking painkillers to try to, uh, uh, to try to relieve his pain, but the coating he's taking just isn't quite hitting it all the time. And sometimes he takes too much. And, um, some of the problems we see with the uh, uh, oxycodone epidemic. It just he's using doctor's advice, try to relieve his pain, but uh, just can't quite get at it. And so that was really kind of uh, really started going downhill after that. Um, started off very kind of obsessive compulsive, but you know, like a lot of uh, mental conditions, they start as coping mechanisms, way of dealing with stress. Hughes had an incredible life for detail. Brilliant, I said, brilliant man. Um, but what made him a success in business, that obsessive eye for detail, just made his personal life worse and worse over time. Uh, add into that coding and head injuries, he just slowly started losing control. Uh, except people liked being around him because he was exciting. He was a really interesting person, very talkative, um, but a little eccentric, a little off. Um, and those eccentricities turned into uh, peculiarities and just got us getting it's kind of weird over time. That not a bad person, very good person, but just very generous to his friends, great patron of charity, great businessman. But it started going a little more off the deep end uh, because no one was there to tell him no. Uh, people really didn't, he wouldn't really sit down long enough for people to kind of examine his condition. Saying all these plans he had, like for building airplanes and his businesses, it seemed to investors like it was very like he flew his planes, kind of seat of his pants, kind of he was a daredevil as a pilot and a daredevil as an executive. But a daredevil pilot, though, they're skilled, they know exactly what they need to do, they know exactly the capabilities of aircraft. And Hughes had the same kind of knowledge about his business, he knew what he needed to do, he knew what his businesses were capable of. He could see the numbers running through his head, even if his investors couldn't. Even though they thought he was taking an unnecessary risk with his businesses, Hughes knew what he was doing, and he almost always came out ahead. That's starting out with Hughes' tool as a base, kind of builds on from there. His uh, film-making career and his aircraft building just gets more and more money. For long, he has more money he knows to do with already rich man, but gets even richer. But uh, the combination of years of stress, of fighting, uh, these battles, these other uh, captains of industry, uh, politicians, um, stress in his personal life, 
and plus the stress of all these physical injuries it just gets worse for me. Dies more and more into his obsessive compulsion and uh, starts coming increasingly reclusive, a little paranoid, uh, this obsessive attention for detail and control. He wants everything done just right. And so he's just steadily getting worse. And as his pain worsens, especially after his accidents, he just um, he just gets where he just doesn't want to deal with people pretty much. So he starts coming more and more reclusive. Uh, like the late 1950s, there's this famous incident where he just locks him, he just locks himself in his uh, personal movie theater's mansion and stays there for four months. Just has AIDS, just slipping, slipping meals and everything under the door. He records messages, sending out to them so he doesn't have to deal with people and finally just wanders out four months later. You know, the man had uh, the resources to get the help he needed. He just, he just didn't want to get it. And so this man brilliant his whole life, he just slowly loses control until finally he's just this hermit that is as much legend than man than he was a man anymore. What about his acquisition of or procurement of um, RKO? I, I want to talk about his Hollywood career because obviously that leads into the stardoms a little bit, but it's I, I heard the only really successful thing, and like I said, I guess I'm noticing there's varying perspectives on Howard Hughes, but everyone kind of said that his only really success was his the, the drill bit. That was his only really everything else. It seemed like kind of ended up being, you know, Spruce Goose never. I mean, it flew technically, but it never actually got deployed, uh, which we could talk about and things of that sort. But I, it started to me like a lot of stuff started looking like tax dodges or things of that sort, which is just smart business if you really look at it and examine it. We can get into that. But his entertainment thing, I mean, that's where I learned about the conquest and the people that ended up dying of cancer on the film set. Then he buys all the copies of it where I'm like, why? And then like he reran them over and over again. And I was like, either that's someone that's probably in pain. That's just like, I obviously did a deed that's really bad. I didn't mean to, but now I'm going to put myself through. And that's a form of self-torture, rewatching those over again. And people go, no, I think he was just sick. I go, no, that's a form of self-torture. If you're, you know, you, you something happened, a bunch of people died of cancer or something, and you're now watching your film, this thing that you produced that caused this over and over again in seclusion. There's no benefit to that. There's nothing that you get from, you don't get a sick kick from that, especially because there's nobody around to watch you be happy about it so obviously he was putting himself through pain which i mean his whole life now that you kind of examine it you really start to look at it yeah it was a lot of pain mm -hmm. a lot of loss from an early age uh, not a lot of close relationships um close relationships he did were basically with employees yeah he was very good to the employees but uh exact not everything to be just exact that obsessive uh, desire for control and detail the can of peaches man I know you know that story about wiping it down and having gloves on and doing it in like a specific way. You got to pour it out and make sure you, none of it gets outside the bowl that it's going to be placed in. I heard that from one of his employees at the Desert Inn talked about doing that for him whenever he wanted his peaches. I was like, that's such a weird thing, but it's interesting. And he always had the same thing for dinner, a steak, medium rare, a particular size with uh, green peas. And the green peas had to be arranged, lined up. Every meal. Um, actually, and that obsession for detail that helped him in his movie career. Uh, actually, started except nineteen twenties. America's fallen in love with the movies, and Howard Hughes with it. He wants to make movies too. Uh, first movie is actually something called The Racket, uh, silent film uh, about uh, police corruption in Chicago during Prohibition. Um, he was a producer on it, but as a producer, you know, he had a lot of uh, say in kind of how the movie kind of went along, but uh, uh, that movie's nominated for an Academy Award in 1929. A real technical achievement. Uh, and his movies, a lot of them may not have had a lot, gotten a lot of attention, may not have gotten a lot of, may not have a lot of money, but uh, they really got people's attention. We talked about Hell's Angels, uh, really filmed that as a silent movie, but uh, when sound came along, he remade the whole movie with sound. Uh, the aerial dog fights uh, were state of the art at the time. Um, uh, even some color scenes in uh, that, and that was a very expensive, very difficult process. Some color and some, but most of them black and white. 
uh, that really kind of set the standard for uh, movies involving uh, um, airplanes for the future. Um, say a Scarface. That was one of his big gritty uh, 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 movies, 1932. It was known most for the violence. Kind of tame by today's standards, but uh, really kind of shocked off or two. This is you know before the Hayes Code and everything like that. They tried to put restrictions on what people could uh, uh, put in their movies yeah, for uh, people with more gentler tastes. Yeah, Scarface is so successful that uh, yeah that they end up remaking it in the 1980s. The version with Al Pacino as the Miami drug baron. This 1930s version was with the uh, um based on the life of Al Capone, but couldn't say it was Capone because you know the guy's still alive. Mm-hmm. He didn't want to get caught with libel laws, but yeah, that was a real. I think libel laws is the least thing you should be concerned about. That man would have you whacked. He would. <laughs> uh, and later on, that's kind of how the story, how he ends up acquiring some of these hotels in uh, Las Vegas. Uh, Hughes began the transition in Las a- Vegas of the casinos being controlled by the mob to being controlled by businessmen. If you ever saw a casino with the. Uh, uh, with Robert De Niro and Joe Pesci, you know, the kind of talks about towards the end of that era. Uh, everything being trolled by gangsters, but then the corporations coming in and taking over in Las Vegas, trying to turn something a little bit more respectful and a little less seedy. Which is weird because he chose the Mormons to do it. And if you look at his train of thought of why he did it, it was because he believed that in their beliefs that they were honest and they wouldn't, he wouldn't ever have to worry about thefts or anything of that sort. And it was like kind of based on an assumption of like that their religious beliefs, they'd stick by this code. But it seemed to work for him because he they managed to run his stuff effectively. And also he was able to a- acquire more casinos as it went on. Except the Mormons Latter-day Saint Church, they, they are very much against gambling. Um, but uh, like I said, hardly any Mormons in Houston, uh, especially at the turn of the century when he was a kid, but uh, when he moved out west, like I said, a lot, a very large Mormon population in the west from about Utah to uh, Cal- west, western Colorado all the way out to California, and he got to know the Mormon population well. Uh, yeah, the Mormons are capable of failings like anybody else, but uh, uh, they try to live a very strict lifestyle of a uh, Dressing properly, being hygienic, um, being honest in your dealings. Um, Sunday Mormon community really kind of pride itself on, and he thought uh, that was something kind of people he wanted to work with, kind of people he could trust, especially as his um, clarity and his ability to trust people is slowly wearing down. Did you ever have any thoughts on the movie The Conquest and his kind of influence or his creation of that? Yeah, it kind of. Uh, interesting movie. Uh, he wanted to make this big epic movie about Genghis Khan, you know, the huge uh, conqueror from the 13th century, man who had an empire from Siberia all the way to Poland and all the way down into China. Um, and wanted to make this huge epic movie about the life of that just really was a, a fascinating character. But uh, but he chose John or, Wayne. Yeah. Like I said, Ward was out all over town. He wanted to make this movie, and John Wayne actually lobbied for it. And uh, yeah, John Wayne, huge movie star at the time. He really loves John Wayne. And um, Hughes, he'd kind of met him before, knew people worked with him, said, this this kind of guy I want for this. But it's actually turned out to be the one of the worst choices possible. Because John Wayne, he'd built his career about that point, uh, already a 20-year-old movie career, uh, based on being kind of this shoot from the hip every man. Just an ordinary guy who's just not going to take any nonsense off anybody. And it's kind of an idea that really kind of made him a legend in the American imagination. People kind of saw the American man of the 1940s and 50s kind of saw himself as a John Wayne type. And that's kind of the character John Wayne always played. Not, uh, But with Genghis Khan, you have to play this kind of this regal ruler. You have to have this kind of stage presence, someone that sets you apart from everyone else. Like say, and somebody like say, Yul Brynner probably would have been a better choice. They will play it better, not uh, 
uh, slinky white guy from uh, Missouri. <laughs> but uh, he just couldn't carry off the movie. But Hughes was really proud of this project. This is one of his last films he makes, is uh, owning Archeo. I mean, he owned the whole thing, one of the, one of the last uh, men to own a huge studio outright on his own. He didn't have to answer to uh, uh, investors or studio executives. He was the studio. And he wanted this movie with John Wayne. Well, everything was just kind of a disaster. The, Wayne couldn't quite carry off the uh, uh, the role. Writing was off. And, of course, they're doing the filming, trying to recreate steps of Asia, so they need this kind of isolated uh, spot that's kind of hilly and kind of arid. So what do they choose? Nevada. And so they're making the movie, and, well, this is when they still had above-ground nuclear testing. Cold War. And they conducted a test nearby. Well, everyone assumed it was safe. You know, the United States government carried out this test because we're trying to test uh, nuclear weapons make sh to show the communists we're not we're going to stand up to. I right, trusted this is going to be safe. Uh, people had ideas about radiation sickness, radiation poisoning, but it really hadn't trickled down into the popular imagination yet. People didn't know a lot about it. And they trusted the government's going to take care of this. But there had already been a lot of problems with these above ground tests. Uh, think of the disaster in the Bikini Islands, some of the upper, uh, they test this uh, nuclear bomb at sea, and the upper winds uh, end up shifting around and carrying fallout over the population, forcing the government to basically evac evacuate the area. The Russians were having the same problems. A lot of theories that some of these uh, nuclear tests out in Nevada may have been responsible for a lot of cases of cancer for people of uh, the baby boom generation because the fallout being carried by the upper level jet stream ends up uh, trickling down over Colorado and Kansas and Nebraska, a lot of grazing land for cattle who are producing milk, which in turn is ingested by young kids in the 1950s. That's one of those reasons why they end up banning above ground nuclear tests that all the trees mean the nuclear powers of the 1960s. But, uh, you know, something went wrong with this one test. The fallout ended up kind of coming nearby. Um, it had diluted enough that it wasn't immediately deadly. They're far enough away. But uh, um, while it came in and in the years afterward, a lot of people started getting sick. The story is that most of the crew and the cast end up getting cancer at some point because of that, exposure radiation. John Wayne very famously struggled with cancer in the last years of his life. Now, whether it was because of this nuclear test while making the uh, um, now the Conqueror, or whether it was because years of chain smoking, um, we're not entirely sure. But uh, yeah, John Wayne got sick and he died of cancer. I don't remember the shootist. Uh, that was one of his last film. Uh, his character actually was kind of reflecting John Wayne in real life. This guy kind of towards the end of his life, kind of legendary figure. Uh, he has cancer. What the plot of the shootist? Um. But when the movie Conqueror came out, it was critically panned. People didn't think, John Wayne, this isn't a John Wayne movie. Um, a lot of people were making fun of it. Um, and that really kind of hurt Howard Hughes because, you know, he put so much passion into this. He loved that movie. Um, loved all the actors involved. Um, they weren't entirely sure about uh, the radiation yet. Um, but the movie barely broke even. But he was so upset by all the uh, criticism of it, he just decided to you know, buy up all the copies of it and watch it over and over again. He just, because he was proud of it. He was hurt by all these accusations. And he was at the point in his life, um, 50 years old, near billionaire status. He didn't need to put up any kind of criticism. He didn't need uh, people griping, complaining, and, micro and uh, analyzing every one of the steps. They so just watched the movie over and over again. Part of it was just because he was in such pain at this time that uh, um, basically he just needed something to watch and distract his attention. 
And that's actually something that a lot of people suffering from chronic pain do is uh, they'll watch something, watch a movie over and over again. They'll try to have something just to distract them for a while. And that's one thing that Howard Hughes was doing. Um, Con the rise of the Conqueror were later bought out by other studios, but the, the movie was just widely panned and that just really just complexed him because one thing about Howard Hughes was when he wanted to do something, he went in all the way. Um, always uh, this huge passion. Everything was a passion project. If you had the money like he did, you really could. Yeah, he could. Like say, loses a million here, loses a million there, not a big deal to him. You know, it, it always has a way figured out. Um, yeah, because a lot of his uh, business schemes, yeah, he did have a, he did get into a lot of, uh, was subject to a lot of IRS investigation, but he beat every one of them because he always saw the numbers. He always saw the loopholes. Even no one else did. He knew how to work the system. Can I ask your opinion on the um, John Wayne film? Do you think that he was, because he became an early environmentalist technically. I mean, he was going against the atomic weapons testing. Do you think it was because of the um, John Wayne stuff or, or the, the, the Conqueror movie? Or do you think it was because of, I know people mention his germophobia. And that's what's really hard about like history because you'll see different perspectives on certain events. But I don't know when he developed his germophobia. I don't really start reading accounts until later on in his life. He started having kind of really bad germophobia. Like I know he was married to his one wife and they never, I think throughout the 14 or however long they were married, they only really spent like maybe a month together total. And that was, yeah. This, the, yeah. Uh, yeah. He married her in like the late fifties and uh, they spent very little time together. He was always became increasingly reclusive, even from his own wife. And uh, eventually by the time they divorced in 1970, she hadn't really seen him in years. Um, and, uh, Howard Hughes, he still thought the world of John Wayne. In fact, his next movie after The Conqueror, the, his last one, his head of RKO, um, was a jet pilot. That was a he put John Wayne in the starring role. And then after that, he sold the movie, made 10, pocketed $10 million off of it. Actually, still thought the world of John Wayne, but uh, uh, he was a germaphobe from an early age. Uh, they think that some of that might have come from his mother and from a uh, the panics over cholera epidemics and the yellow fever uh, outbreaks in Houston uh, when he was a kid. But also more and more, it just kind of came a coping mechanism as OCD kind of grew out of control. Um, except kind of came uh, at the way he's kind of was a recluse and kind of obsessed with germs. That kind of came up. Uh, that kind of came up big as part of his image as anything else. I don't know if you remember this episode of the simpsons from years and years ago uh, uh mr burns buys this casino and uh he re uh he kind of comes as howard hughes character this kind of recluse um uh, he owns the power company he owns the casino he has all the money and he's recognizing this uh, the only thing to stop me is little tiny germs <laughs> um and just becomes a a parody of Howard Hughes after that. But uh, yeah, he was obsessed with uh, germs and health. In fact, uh, uh, from an early age, after he inherited his uh, father's fortune, uh, he wanted to set up as a, a center to uh, study medicine. In fact, he later established it by the 1950s, the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, still one of the most, uh, one of the largest endowments of any nonprofit in the world. They, do all sorts of research into uh, uh, cures for all sorts of deadly diseases. And they have made a lot of important advances because of Howard Hughes's vision. Um, as an environmentalist, um, actually after uh, World War II, a lot of people started recognizing, you know, uh, the damage that uh, the factories industrialization is doing. It was, uh, um, and, um, uh, I think part of that uh, obsessive compulsiveness uh, kind of was feeding into that, that germophobia, but also just a recognition that, uh, you know, he had a responsibility to uh, help preserve the environment. Worries about uh, radiation uh, and everything. Um, in fact, uh, when he was in Nevada in some of his later uh, years, there was 
the government's still doing underground nuclear testing, supposedly safe. But uh, their stories, he was trying to offer bribes to Lyndon Johnson and Richard Nixon not to conduct these tests. I've seen the memos on that. That's real. Yeah. it's. Fi I think it was he offered a million dollars or five hundred thousand dollars to Johnson sent a letter through Robert Mayhew and he apparently told Robert Mayhew but Mayhew it's the every it's kind of theorized that he didn't actually say anything to Johnson about it um he just kind of told Howard he would or just was taking a letter for Howard um but I've seen the letter that is available to look up which is interesting just to read also letters from John Wayne to Howard Hughes about, Hey, I know I'm on my third movie out of our five movie contract, but I was wondering if, you know, and he's just like, kind of like trying to find a way to get out of the shooting the film. And I'm just like, that's so interesting to me. I don't know. You see these, like I said, larger than life characters and they're just having these average conversations, concerns just about workplace or concerns about just like, Hey, he stopped testing bombs near where I live. That'd be amazing. Yeah. That's the thing. Uh, you have these larger life figures and celebrities, and you realize, you know, uh, they're really just ordinary people. Um, you know, uh, you meet somebody like, say, Jimmy Carter, uh, just a um, man just conducts a Sunday um, when he's younger and better health. Just, just a farmer just goes in uh, as a Sunday school class at a uh, little church in Plains, Georgia, but uh, and realized, oh, years ago, this man was president of the United States. Um, or just meet uh, ordinary actors and so forth. Uh, may, uh, some people may know him as kids. Just, uh, oh, yeah, just, uh, just this guy, just another kid. And just realize, oh, my gosh, now he's all, got all this money and everybody in the world knows who he is. What was uh, Howard the, Hughes's obsession with Jane Russell? Uh, she's a beautiful woman. I know Everybody she is beautiful, is but the outlaw, I mean, if you watch that film, it's not really anything but boob shots. And I'm like, if you're watching it and I know there's, I saw, I read it and I was like, there's no way that someone did that. And then I'm like watching, like you can like look at like clips and stuff and you're just kind of like, oh, this is a hundred percent. There has to be like a record number of shots where they were just like, let's try and find, you can get her chin in it. Sure. But that's not what we're looking for. But then, like, you see the controversy afterwards and Howard Hughes fighting against the censorship offices to try and keep that movie in there. And then eventually, I think they did take it down and redo it or do something to it to make it different. Um, but it's just funny how he stood on that hill like, no, this is how it has to be. He would. And that's kind of the way he was, the way he worked in business. And usually he won. Um, actually, everybody was obsessed with Jane Russell in the 1940s. Um, actually, Howard Hughes had dated so many of these starlets, and he actually tried to. Uh, start a relationship with Jane Russell, but uh, she uh, turned him down. And but he respected her. All right, he said no. Okay, I respect that. And they had a, a very warm, close uh, friendship the rest of their lives. Um, but uh, yeah, the outlaw that was very risque for 1943, middle of the Hayes Code, uh, and. Uh, it was really just pushing the boundaries. Even if the movie's made, not say nineteen sixty three, it would have had a lot of the same problems. But by nineteen seventy three, it would have been actually been considered kind of tame in a lot of ways. But uh, yeah, this is the movie he wanted to make, uh, all about Jane Russell, this beautiful woman out in the uh, west, and uh, he wanted it done this way. And there are a bunch of problems with the censorship boards, and he fought it. Uh, made a couple of minor changes here and there. Now, even like a lot of mo modern movies, they'll uh, uh, cut a couple of scenes or cut a couple of uh, words out to get the R rating instead of the NC-17 or whatever. And uh, Hughes uh, did that, uh, made just a couple of minor changes, but uh, basically kept the bulk of it intact. Like I said, well, it really went to bat for Jane Russell, really went to bat for all of his friends in uh, so many cases. Did I ask about when he arrived in Las Vegas and when he kind of acquired the Desert Inn? And then it, you know, I, I don't think he went nuts after that. I think it was more he started buying up casinos. And then eventually, I think towards the later years in his life before he was wrapped up um, is when he started uh, doing the blackout. I don't know why he put tape on the, I never heard. That's so strange to me. Yeah. Uh he was already showing serious signs of problems in the 1950s, um, in the 1940s, but uh, 
1960s really kind of started um, losing control of, gave up RKO so he could concentrate on his airline, TWA, and it was a very profitable airline while he was still running it. Um, eventually, in 1966, he uh, forced to sell TWA because of all the lawsuits uh, flying back and forth and sold the airline for like $560 million. Uh, huge amount of money. But still, very good business. They're a very sharp uh, eye for detail, but just kind of losing control in his personal life. And uh, he just didn't want to be bothered by anybody. He just wanted to stay out of the public eye. He just uh, just withdrew from society. But he already had such a reputation around the world. People still want to know about Howard Hughes, filmmaker, uh, ace pilot, businessman. Just no matter what he seemed to do, he seemed to be complete success at it. Yeah. And he just started wandering, wandering from one place to another, just uh, trying to find just that one perfect spot where you're going to sit and be comfortable and uh, just live his life on his terms. And by 1966, uh, he uh, ended up in uh, Las Vegas. So there for a while and kind of move around here and there for a little bit. But I uh, uh, wanted just the perfect setting, decided, you know what, uh, just avoid all the problems with this one hotel. He's going to buy the whole thing. And for him, that was ba- that hotel's basically pocket change. That was because he was there for like two weeks, and they he was he, kind of refusing to leave. So he was like, "I'll just buy the whole top two floors." Exactly, it, and just wanted to be left alone. Um, so he could stay there as long as he wanted to. And uh, of course, being in the Las Vegas Strip, this being the '60s, um, all the big casinos are operating really bright lights, and uh, a lot from with one. Uh, neighboring casino was kept shining into his window silver spur silver spur so he bought it that's so if crazy i'm telling you man if you have monopoly money that's what you would do i'm telling you that's to me when i read that i was like man he couldn't sleep because this thing was in this is before the blacked out windows and everything and he was like i'll just buy that casino and dim the light or shut the light off i'm like that's man i'm telling you there's like fictional people in this world, like people that we see in movies, that's him. 100% a real-life depiction of that. It is. It's, I'd say he's inspired a lot of characters. Uh, as I said, the the villain in Diamonds Are Forever, the famous Bond film, was based on uh, Howard Hughes. Um, but uh, buying the Silver Spur, that was basically the beginning of the transition from mob control of Vegas to uh, corporate control of Vegas. Because he knew... Because he knew a lot of these guys, and he wasn't a criminal himself, but uh, they kind of ran around the same circles. Um, and and uh, he was able to convince them, let me buy this place, uh, give a good deal for you. And they were happy, and they wandered off. And so uh, that's when he uh, had bought the hotel, bought the casino, ended up buying a whole bunch of real estate in around Las Vegas. And uh, Las Vegas was just starting to grow rapidly. Um. Yeah, the interstates were coming through, so it was uh, uh, a lot of uh, so a lot of people were to drive from Los Angeles to Vegas on the weekend just to do whatever. And Vegas, yeah, it was uh, an anything goes kind of town. You want to find it, you can find it. Would you say Las Vegas benefited from Howard Hughes? Oh, quite a bit. Okay. Uh, he helped kind of uh, after kind of. Resting control from some of these casinos, kind of minimizing the mob element city, or at least kind of putting it under some control, at least pushing it underground a little bit. So it'll make Las Vegas kind of seem a little bit more respectable. You know, gambling was legal in Vegas. Prostitution was legal in Vegas. So, uh, liquor completely illegal everywhere in uh, Nevada. Um, you wanted to find it. You wanted to find trouble. You could find it in Vegas. It was legal. It's the same thing with Cuba in the 1950s for Castro Kafka, or just kind of, it was just an adult playground. And uh, you know, the people in Vegas, people in Nevada, you now they wanted to uh, kind of keep control over that because they want to keep that little bit of money in that pocket for themselves, keep it in Nevada, and help develop Nevada. But they know to do that over the long term, they have to be able to bring in families. And so with Hoover Van- Dam, which is not far, like 30 miles from Las Vegas, Huge hydroelectric dam, pipelines, uh, bringing water, 
uh, electricity to the city. You're able to make this huge city in the middle of the desert, which otherwise would not have existed. Las Vegas didn't exist before Hoover Dam, but uh, brought in Hoover Dam, um, and he brought in the casinos, and uh, before long, Vegas is what it is today. A huge city, 250, 300,000 people. Um, most people in Nevada live within just 20 miles of Las Vegas. And uh, yeah, Hughes helped kind of make that kind of make uh, Las Vegas a good investment, safe investment, a respectable investment. Um, everything outside of Vegas was basically desert land, but uh, Hughes recognized, hey, people will be living here one day. He saw his hat, he grew up in Houston. He'd seen, he'd seen Los, Los Angeles grow. That, um, what had been farmland or scrub brush, that could be a, ha a whole subdivision. One day. And he did that. Um, they started buying up other hotels, other casinos, uh, just living the life of a king. Um, yeah, so the whole thing over banana nut ice cream. He loved banana nut ice cream, sent an order for it. <coughs> Eating. He loved banana nut ice cream, but the Baskin Robbins, they discontinued the uh, flavor. So he had to get a special order of it, but the minimum order was 350 gallons. No problem. That's pocket change for him. So he orders 350 gallons, uh, has it stored in the hotel freezer. Um, as the hotel freezer is big enough, but gets it, has a couple of bowls and signs, doesn't want it anymore. Just keep it. But the hotel's stuck with all this ice cream and they have to they end up giving out free bowls of banana and ice cream for years afterward. Crazy. I gotta ask about um his recluse years, uh, because this leads to what I would call an important area in his life and it's not it's towards the very end before his death in my opinion before his death i've seen this kind of be controversial the clifford uh irving hoax where the guy writes this biography and then howard hughes actually comes on through a telephone and speaks to all these people in a broadcasting room and i know i've seen people say that they don't think it was howard hughes i've seen people say it was it was howard hughes and the guy clifford uh irving was a liar one thing that is interesting, if you know Orson Welles, he made a book or a movie called F is for Fake, and Clifford Irving is the other half of that uh, film. Clifford Irving was helping Orson Welles make this film called F is for Fake about a guy who's doing this hoax scandal thing. And it's just pure irony that Clifford Irving is, himself was doing a hoax. And uh, Orson Welles ended up changing half of the biography or whatever the biopic was to part of it being about Clifford Irving and this Howard Hughes incident. So I would like to ask about his recluse years when he started taping up the desert Inn, when he started kind of putting Kleenex boxes on his feet, whatever you know about the recluse years and that we can get into the Clifford Irving part. Yeah. Uh, his recluse, recluse of nature really kind of started by the 1950s and into the 1960s. Um, they're just kind of losing control years of, Head injuries and obsessive compulsive disorders getting worse and worse. Plus, he's taking codeine all the time. He's just steadily kind of losing control, but he's still got his good business edge. Knew good opportunity to be sought, and he had the money and the knowledge to make it happen. He knew how to hire the right people to make it happen. <clears throat> so, uh, by the 1960s, really, it's kind of really kind of hitting its peak uh, or getting to its peak. It's a uh, one doesn't want to do anything to do with anything. He's hardly around his own wife and starts spending more and more time in hotel rooms around the world, just living there in these penthouse suites, going from one to another to another. Um, just still, he's kind of losing touch with reality. But he's surrounded by all these people basically who will not tell him no, will not tell him, you need to stop. You need to go to a doctor. You need to do something about this. You need to take care of yourself. Um, he just wouldn't listen to him, or no one around him would be willing to tell him what he wanted. Um, so, yeah, by the 1960s, he decided he's going to move into this hotel in Las Vegas. It starts moving from one to another to another. And we still, to this day, know very little about that part of his life. 
He's completely out of the public eye. We know about some of his financial dealings back and forth, those little foibles, but uh, we don't know a lot about the man himself. Even his wife didn't know anything about it, didn't even know where he was. But uh, he was uh, letting his hair grow long. Uh, a lot of times he just wouldn't dress himself, wouldn't groom himself. Um, uh, yes, he would actually, uh, sometimes he would just have these long fits where he just kind of lock himself into a room and just, um, he would just slip in food to him and he'd uh, urinate into uh, little jars in the rooms. It's really kind of sad, this man is kind of living this kind of life. And <clears throat> along comes Clifford Irving, because, you know, that's time of the late 1960s. Howard Hughes had been in the public eye for decades. Everybody knew who Howard Hughes was. Cultural icon. In fact, there's a famous band of the 1970s called itself the Hughes Corporation, based on uh, Howard Hughes. Um, but people were knowing more and more he was eccentric and he's just kind of out of touch and reclusive. And people are trying to figure out just kind of who is this? What, what's happened to this man? Well, how is he living? And so along comes Clifford Irving writer and uh, writes this biography of uh, Howard Hughes. Um, very sensationalistic. And uh, he publishes it. And then everyone's kind of asking questions about it. Howard Hughes initially doesn't respond to it. Uh, but uh, but later on, he do Howard Hughes does have a press conference about it. And uh, all the things because uh, Clifford Irving saying, yeah, he's uh, he's got toenails that are six inches long. He's wearing uh, uh, Kleenex boxes for shoes. And so Howard Hughes has this uh, press conference, but in a very Howard Hughes kind of way, still the ultimate recluse. He has several reporters sit in this uh, hotel room in Las Vegas, this little conference room in a hotel in Las Vegas, and conducts it by phone. At least what we think is Howard Hughes. It sounded like him, but he's denying everything. Uh, there's one clip saying, someone asked him about the toenails and the Kleenex shoes, and he's kind of laughing at it. Well, if I, my toenails were that long, how could I even walk? But sadly, though, it's not things like that kind of were the truth. Um, now, how much uh, was made up, how much of it was the truth, how much he got from Clifford Irving got from these different people, we really don't know. But ultimately decided, yeah, he made up most of it. Um, so we got the big Orson Welles the film, F is for Fake, classic Welles. Because uh, um, uh, Orson Welles, more and more by that time of the 1970s, is getting into, uh, getting into uh, telling these strange stories about um, how the world, uh, just uh, you know, the abnormal and the paranormal and things like that. <clears throat> Probably because he's trying to make money for his own movies, but just because he's just kind of fascinated. He's kind of fascinated by stories. So Wells made this into a story. The novel is out as a fake in 1971. Wells makes this movie in 1974. <clears throat> 2006, Richard Gere makes this movie based on the whole incident called The Hoax. It was very widely received. It actually comes out just a couple of years after The Aviator, the famous Leonardo DiCaprio film that I use. But uh, everyone knew something was not right with them. They didn't know how because no one could see them. All they could do is this kind of strange third-hand rumors and reports. Uh, he dies in uh, 1976. He's uh, 70 years old. And what happened was he's getting very sick by this point. Lost a ton of weight. He'd gone down to Mexico. He, suddenly his health is failing. And so they try to rush him back to the United States, get him to a hospital. And Hughes dies on the flight back. And the man they found in Hughes's plane was completely unrecognizable. And Howard Hughes, he was always this dapper, dashing figure, always in public. He's dressed to the nines, biggest, fancy suits, uh, you know, little hats, coat, and tie, uh, little smile and grin for the camera. Clean shaven, even um, 
mustache he grew in the 1940s. That was a very neat mustache, but it's cover a scar from that XF-11 accident. <clears throat> um, this still looked really dapper out in public, kind of man you trust to do business with, a kind of man who could tell a great story. But by the 1970s, that wasn't the same man anymore. Hughes had, uh, uh, he was down to 90 pounds. Uh, and 6'4", too. That's 6'4", yeah. Tall that's, man, basically. That, yeah, that's death right there. Yeah. Uh, hair long, uh, unshaven beard is kind of uh, dangling and dirty. They found uh, broken hypodermic needles in his arm because he'd taken injections of codeine. Uh, yeah, the toenails were real long. Uh, just basically, man who just was not taking care of him. Basically, more like a, a homeless man or a man from an asylum than uh, the famous Howard Hughes that charmed the world, made the best movies, uh, made the state of the art aircraft. Uh, uh, of the best pilots in the world. This was not the same man who built a billion dollar empire. In fact, the FBI to, for, to identify him, they had to take his fingerprints, confirm that really was Howard Hughes. And there were actually some rumors for years afterward that maybe Hughes faked his death. So uh, it really was Hughes. <clears throat> but during those uh, years, there are uh, bizarre reports of people meeting Howard Hughes like this. They didn't believe it was him. Uh, very famous movie, uh, 1980, called Melvin and Howard. Yeah. Jason Robar, big pop star. That, uh, based on one of these incidents, a man named Melvin Dumar, gas station attendant in uh, Nevada. He's driving out a uh, night one day and sees this man uh, kind of derelict, uh, kind of falling down in a ditch, goes to help him, Helps him out um, and takes him for guy. And the guy asks Dumar to take him for a ride back into Las Vegas. Drop off at a hotel. He does that and just talks to him on the way. And the guy tells him he's Howard Hughes. And Dumar's like, No way, that's Howard Hughes. No way. Did not look anything like a disheveled looking man. Um, he said he just came back from a bordello. Um, just want to ride back to his hotel. Um, said, no way that was Howard Hughes. That how Hughes said, the guy suggested he was Hughes, dropped off at the same hotel, everything lined up right. And not long after Hughes died, this will is delivered to Dumar. The Mormon will. This, yeah, the famous Mormon will. Um, and it lists out a whole bunch of uh, things that charities and people he's giving money out to. And among those things like, $156 million, this one man who gave him a ride one night, Melvin Dumar. Well, he doesn't know what to do with it. He's kind of perplexed and shocked, so he does what he thinks is the right thing. He takes it to the Mormon church. Thinks that they got a lot of good lawyers there, a lot of good, honest people. They should be able to tell him what he needs to do. And uh, the Mormons, they take this to court. Uh, cause there are a lot of, they gave a lot of money to the Mormon church, too. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, uh, the lawyers are trying to figure it out. Is this actually, was this actually Hughes' will? Was it a forgery? Because he actually had made a will years ago, or at least they thought he had, but uh, uh, the lawyers for his, um, his estate uh, decide, no, the Mormon will was a forgery. And that uh, Hughes had died intestate without a will at all. And whether he had or not, uh, really some question about it because this man had billions of dollars to give away and the bulk of it made, and in the end the courts divide up among like 20 22 of his cousins he didn't have any kids at all but in the mormon will his ex-wives were provided for a big huge fund for the howard hughes medical institute different charities for his executives trying to make sure everyone was taken care of but the court said that was a forgery but no idea if it was or not just it's one of those bizarre little things about Howard Hughes and the movie Melvin and Howard is based on that. It's a popular movie, 1980. I'm going to ask you one last question because you've given me enough of your time, Ken. I really appreciate the knowledge that you have on Howard Hughes. He's a fascinating subject, but do you yeah. do you look at Howard Hughes? Like, what do you think about his life? Everything we've discussed so far, do you look at? I mean, to me, it's the best depiction of life and tragedy. 
I think it is. It's a, an incredible man who did so much, uh, accomplished so much, but in the end is a, a real tragedy. Just someone who's lost control of himself, lost his mind, and just ended up just being this tragic figure at the end, someone who just um, spent so much of his life trying to control everything around him, but in the end he couldn't. Spent so much time trying to build himself up in the American imagination, but when he went to withdraw, he couldn't. And uh, all these things he tried to do to preserve his health and to take care of himself, and uh, in the end, he couldn't. Well, Ken, where uh, can people find your links, man? You've given me enough of your time. Well, uh, my uh, newspaper, my uh, columns are 91 newspapers across the country. Uh, like I say, you can find it through Google searches. I have seven books I've written. You can find those on Amazon.com. Um, and uh, just uh, look for your local newspaper or ask your local newspaper editors to carry the History Minute column, and uh, uh, they'll do it. Well, any of the links I find of yours, I'll make sure to link in the description. Uh, if I find an Amazon link for one of your books, I'll put that in the description as well, too. Um, do you have a social media handle? Just a Facebook page, Ken Bridges. Um, everything's kind of a um, – I never got into TikTok or uh, Instagram or anything like that. Uh, okay. Probably should. I have a Twi YouTube channel, just a Tw collection of different lectures from my classes for – which put you to sleep, but uh, worth looking at. Twitter will help you out. Um, and hey, I've been up uh, 20 something hours and I didn't fall asleep. So you're good, man. Uh, I've got I'm, six kids. I'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but Ken, I'm going to link your links in the description. Seriously, again, thank you so much for discussing Howard Hughes with me. And thanks everybody for listening to this episode of Out of the Blanket. Stay tuned for our next episode.